Good morning from Amasha. It is great pleasure to welcome you all on the second CTNGO webinar today. Our speaker today is Professor Christian Lower. He is Head of Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiology, Medical University of Vienna, Austria. He is also a Chairman of Educational Committee of European Society of Cardiac, Cardiac Radiology. And he is also have the honor to be the Associate Editor of Radiology and has authored many publications which are mostly original articles. So today he will take us through how to improve CT and geography and the focus will be on cardiac CT and the challenges we face uh, while doing this examination. So before I hand over to Professor Lower, I would really want to remind everyone that there will be a Q&A session right at the end, so keep your questions coming. And I will now hand over to Professor Lower. It's over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Tahir, for this kind introduction. Uh, welcome to everybody. Good morning. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here again uh, on the topic, general topic of how to improve my daily CT and geography. Maybe you have listened to uh, the first webinar. Uh, well, we defined a story in three chapters dedicated to the improvement of the daily CT and geography, consisting on chapter one, it's all about contrast, uh, chapter two, less is more, and the third chapter will be really a very practical one, uh, what becomes possible and in going into the clinical practice. Well, the first chapter was very basic about uh, the uh, basic ideas of giving contrast to patients. So the topic of today will be going more into depth and how to achieve more with less. So that means more with less radiation, less contrast, and finally even with less artifacts. But um, so the, the, uh, the title of the chapter today is uh, Less is More. Um, the teaching points will be less radiation dose in CT and geography and how to achieve. It will be less contrast dose in CT and geography and how to combine it with the radiation dose reduction and how to avoid the problems or artifacts when we are talking about CT and geography of the heart. And I will try really to be as uh, practically oriented as even possible. But I think before we can really start with uh, going less and going really into detail, I would just uh, like to recall the, the most important lessons learned from Module 1. Maybe you don't remember or maybe you didn't uh, attend the first uh, webinar. It shouldn't be an issue. Uh, I think it should not be a problem to follow uh, this Chapter 2. But just to make it a little bit easier and just to, to repeat the most important messages, I will just uh, recall the conclusion uh, with took from the, first, uh, uh, from the first webinar about the basics of contrast. We have a very direct relationship between the body weight, the iodine load, and the contrast enhancement. As faster and as higher uh, the iodine load per kilogram body weight is uh, injected to the patient, as higher the enhancement will be, and as higher the total iodine load, as higher the risk of a contrast-induced nephropathy will be. And of course, this will be uh, the basic of, uh, of talking about how to achieve the same result or even better results with less uh, contrast given to the patient. Uh, the second uh, important lessons learned uh, from last time is that injection time should be adapted to the acquisition time, but should never be too short. This is important in times uh, of ultra-fast scanning. The iodine load should be decreased by using low KV protocols, and this um, I, will, I will talk on that uh, really uh, exhaustive uh, during the webinar uh, of today as well. And the body mass index is the most relevant parameter for selecting the total volume of iodine needed to achieve good diagnostic results. And finally, uh, we were talking a lot about the individualization of uh, the examination protocol. We need protocol individualization uh, to uh, optimize the risk-benefit uh, relation to the patient. Uh, patient constitution, scan parameters, and the contrast injection parameters are really closely related to each other. And the protocol individualization makes CT and geographies, of course, more complex, but uh, the results are really appealing and it's really worth uh, to invest uh, this a little bit of, uh, of brain power uh, to optimize your daily protocol. And uh, I will try my best to help you on this way uh, with uh, the next about uh, 45 minutes. Again, the teaching points of today include uh, how to get less radiation, less contrast, and less problems. 
and uh, I will just jump into the first part of the presentation uh, and talk about less radiation dose in CT and geography of the heart. Uh, we could observe, and we are really lucky about that, a really fantastic improvement of the technical um, possibilities uh, at uh, cardiac CT over the last couple of years. And this fantastic improvement really provides uh, new uh, clinical possibilities, so new indications and new possibilities. And thanks to the fantastic improvement of the technical possibilities, most of the challenges that uh, exist for cardiac CT could be solved during the last 10 years. The main challenges uh, include, first of all, uh, the pulsation. Well, you know, the coronary arteries are really closely related to the myocardium. They're really closely related to the heart. So that means that with ever, every single heartbeat, of course, the coronaries uh, show some motion. And we need very good machines to become able to image the coronary arteries without any motion artifacts. And what we have to do and what the machines become possible to do is to transform those blurring uh, images, as we see here, with a lot of pulsation artifacts into very sharp images without having any pulsation artifacts. And the way to go there is that our images at cardiac CT are acquired using a ECG synchronization. ECG synchronization is a great tool, and of course, it's a very efficient way to reduce radiation dose to the patients. However, it's technically really challenging because we have a very fast motion of the coronary arteries during the cardiac cycle. Even if you just look at the uh, motion of the coronary arteries during one heartbeat uh, at a very low heart rate below 60 beats per minute, it's clear that the entire heartbeat just took about one second. But just for a period of 250 or uh, 200, 250 milliseconds, we don't see any or almost no motion of the coronary arteries. So we have a very, very small time window where we are able to investigate the coronary arteries without having any pulsation artifacts. And if the uh, heart rate is going up, this uh, period of time where the coronary arteries don't show any motions becomes shorter and shorter. So with heartbeats above 75, this uh, rest phase of the coronary arteries almost disappear. So we need really very good um, temporary resolution to remain able to image the coronary arteries exactly during this uh, relaxing phase at mid-diastole. It's not the same for all the different segments of the coronary artery tree. However, for all the segments, it's common that they have some kind of rest phase at the mid-diastole. It's around uh, between 60 and 70 percent of the entire RR interval, so about 60 to 70 percent of the entire uh, length of a heartbeat. And again, uh, it's, a, it's a function of the, the heart rate. As higher the heart rate, as shorter this rest phase of the coronary arteries, and as higher our temporal re resolution should be. So there is, of course, a close relationship even between the heart rate and the image quality for uh, cardiac CT, but I will talk about that even later on. We can just uh, exemplify again the relation between the cardiac motion or the, or the cardiac function and the pulsation artifact of the coronary arteries by looking at the changes of the left ventricular volume. Uh, apparently, the uh, change of the left ventricular volume is uh, most uh, is the greatest at systole. So that means. Uh, if you are scanning during systole, we will have uh, the most motion artifacts. If we are really able uh, to scan during mid-diastole, we will end up with really, really sharp images without having any pulsation artifacts. And the very good news is that the um, manufacturers of the machines did a fantastic job over the last uh, couple, of, uh, couple of years. They were able to reduce the temporary resolution of uh, 450 milliseconds in the beginning of the multi-slice area, uh, going down to a temporary resolution far below 100 milliseconds. And this is really fantastic. And this allows us really to image the coronary arteries without uh, pulsation artifacts if the heart rate is not too high. So the fantastic improvement of the temporal resolution almost solved uh, the uh, challenge number one, which is called the pulsation. 
Challenge number two for cardiac CT, of course, is the resolution. We are talking about coronary arteries, and coronary arteries are really, really very small uh, anatomical structures with a diameter between two and four millimeters. Starting with the four slice CT scanners, it means that the slice collimation was just one millimeter, so the anti coronary artery was just imaged by a number of five to nine voxel. Uh, so that means that the assessment of the severity of a stenosis was really not very accurate because of the limited uh, spatial resolution. Nowadays, we are talking about spatial resolutions going down to 0.4, so that means we are much, much better in detecting and, and visualizing uh, uh, lesions and plaques, and we become much more accurate in the assessment of uh, coronary stenosis. So even the challenge number two is almost solved by this exciting improvement of spatial resolution. However, we would still uh, need uh, some further improvement of the spatial resolution, but uh, it becomes much better during the last couple of years. Challenge number three was the, uh, the length of the acquisition, so the, the, the speed of the acquisition. And uh, this was really very frequent that we were confronted with some kind of uh, um, breathing artifacts because the breath hold comment was far too long in previous times. So just to exemplify, at the four slice area, uh, it was possible that the entire scan took up to 40 seconds and it's almost impossible. You will really don't find any patient being able to hold uh, his breath for 40 seconds being in the, in the CT tube and, and getting some iodinated contrast agent into the veins. So breathing artifacts have been really, really a common problem at that time. It becomes better by 16 slice CTs, but nowadays we have acquisition times far below 10 seconds, and that's usually uh, never a problem for any patient. Almost every patient is, uh, is able to hold his breath for at least 10 seconds, even at the CT tube. So even the challenge number three is almost solved by the improvement uh, of the scanners. And of course, even more has become possible uh, by uh, the possibility of so-called high-pitch scanning because this allows for even ultra-fast acquisition within less than one second. Um, it becomes possible uh, with uh, dual tube systems and uh, this allows for uh, investigation and acquisition of an SCT angiogram of the entire heart in really high spatial resolution in less than one second. And this offers really new opportunities for the clinical uh, use of this uh, exciting technique. So even the challenge number three, the acquisition speed, uh, could almost uh, be solved by the fast rotation and even high pitch scanning and the improvement of our, our scanners. Really a story of success if you, if you look for the improvement of the image quality uh, at uh, cardiac CT from 1994 electronic beam CT up to nowadays uh, multi-slice CT scanning here, fantastic improvement of the image quality. And of course, this improvement of uh, image quality is uh, opening new doors for the clinical usage of this technique. To look at it a little bit more uh, in a more um, scientific way or technical way. So if we look for the uh, development of, of CT, we could observe some kind of exponential development during the last 15 to 20 years, very similar to the technology at, at computers in general. So almost every two years, there was really a doubling of performance, including doubling of the rows, but even, even uh, doubling of the uh, temporal and spatial resolution. But it seems that we, we just reached some kind of end uh, of this exponential hardware development. So we are pretty sure that uh, the uh, technique of CT scanners is almost at the end. Of course, there might be some improvement, slight improvements, but not the big steps. Um, we are convinced that the next the big steps in technology will mean new general, in general new type of, uh, of scanners. But the conventional CT scanners, as we know nowadays and as we are using nowadays, this exponential development is uh, uh, on its upper limit. However, uh, we don't have uh, just the, this fantastic improvement and the new opportunities by this improvement of image quality resolution acquisition. We also uh, um, paid this uh, improvement uh, by uh, increased radiation um, exposure to the patient. 
So, of course, uh, due to the new opportunities and new possibilities uh, of cardiac CT, uh, the amount of radiation exposure to the entire population becomes bigger because we are doing much more cardiovascular imaging, non-invasive cardiovascular imaging, um, as compared to 20 years before. So the general radiation exposure to the entire population uh, becomes bigger. And of course, there are some critical uh, voices talking about, well, of course, maybe um, you, you avoid an, uh, coronary uh, syndrome, but maybe uh, you are inducing cancer just by cardiac imaging. And unfortunately, some numbers has been published in the past were not be really appropriate. There were some, some uh, mistakes uh, and misspellings in the names. And um, for a given period of time, there was really uh, a big uh, scare in the literature, uh, maybe that uh, cardiac imaging is too dangerous to the population. I found this uh, editorial uh, has been published in Jack really, really helpful and really on the point in that, well, and uh, I think we can really read between the lines uh, what uh, the, uh, the editors would say here about the realization of the increase in radiation exposure to the population from medical procedures and the resulting potential cancer risk rightly sounded an alarm to which the medical imaging field has an obligation to respond aggressively. So uh, it's always just the, uh, the, the point of view, but there is no discussion that, uh, especially in the, in the start time of uh, cardiac CT, the radiation exposure was really an issue and much too high. So the standard 64 slice uh, uh, scanners they were uh, combining a cardiac CT with a radiation exposure to the patient of about more than 20 millisieverts. And of course, this is a lot, and maybe this is far too much for a diagnostic procedure only. So that means, beside all the fantastic technical improvements that we could observe during the last couple of years, uh, solving uh, nearly all uh, pre-existing challenges of cardiac CT, the radiation dose is really becoming um, an important uh, issue, but, and this uh, I will show you in the next, thanks to the uh, exciting technical process, even the radiation dose becomes a less important issue. And of course, this is providing new chances and uh, definitely new, um, new uh, clinical applications. However, um, beside this uh, exciting technical process, uh, providing a better temporal resolution, better uh, spatial resolution, um, the radiation dose uh, remained the most relevant uh, issue uh, interfering with the broad use of uh, coronary CT angiography. And uh, that's why I will talk in the next part of my presentation about uh, how to reduce the radiation dose in uh, a cardiac CT angiography. And there are many, many buttons that you can push. There are many wheels that you can turn, uh, and all of them are related to each other, and all of them really helps to, really help to reduce the radiation exposure to the patient. You can do a lot by uh, choosing the appropriate way of ECG synchronization. Uh, you should apply a dose modulation. Uh, you should uh, adapt uh, your acquisition technique. Uh, some parts of uh, this uh, was already addressed in the first uh, webinar, but I will focus on that uh, here as well. So these changes at the acquisition technique include uh, the low KV, include the low MIS and online modulation. And of course, at the final end, you can do something uh, uh, while uh, image reconstruction by applying an iterative reconstruction mode to reduce the uh, background noise here. When we're talking about ECG synchronization, that's the first uh, thing that you can do or that you have think, uh, to think about uh, when you're thinking about radiation dose reduction. We have two main principles. Uh, we can do a prospective ECG triggering or we can do a retrospective ECG gating. Uh, and the diff different trigger techniques uh, uh, are combined with really a huge difference in the, in the radiation exposure. When you have a prospective triggering, uh, you are acquiring sequential scans, uh, the so-called step and shoot principle, and the delay is determined before the start and it's almost fixed. 
So how it looks in the reality, you have your ECG signal here, and the scanner is detecting the period of time that it takes from the R wave to uh, starting of the mid-diastole, so after 60 or 70 percent of the total durance of an RR interval is passed, and then the images are acquired. And this delay time between the R wave and starting the, uh, the acquisition is almost fixed. So this is just an example of the trigger card as your scanner. You see here 70% of the hour interval, nothing will happen. And then there is the acquisition uh, during the mid-diastole. Another example, just to, to uh, exemplify this, you have your first heartbeat after 70% of uh, our interval passed, you will have uh, your uh, image acquisition, then the table is moved to the next position, and then the over next heartbeat, uh, the next uh, couple of slices will be acquired during the mid-diastole. To avoid um, any, any uh, add effect or to reduce the add effect, uh, if uh, there are some slight uh, changes of the, um, of the heartbeat, which is physiological, uh, usually the scanners are uh, counting for three heartbeats and they are, uh, they are <coughs> taking the median of the RR interval of uh, three following heartbeats and is determining the delay based on the last three heartbeats. And this step and shoot protocol provides really good results in case of stable and low heart rates. But of course, ectopic beats might be critical. If everything uh, went fine, then you uh, went up, and you will end up uh, with uh, maybe a result like this here. So just three shots, and the entire heart is um, visualized in a good image quality. So that means that the radiation exposure is rather low because you just need three very short shots during the mid-diastole. To avoid any, uh, any, any bad results due to uh, extrasystole, most of the scanners uh, provide the possibility of uh, online detection of extrasystole. So that means if the scanner detected uh, at this position there was an ectopic heartbeat and the images were acquired during some kind of systole, the scanner will not move the table uh, for the next heartbeat, will remain on the same position, will wait for the next normal heartbeat, and will acquire the image data in the next heartbeat, and will just move afterwards. This is helpful for low heart rates, and if there is only one extrasystole, if there are more extrasystole, then it will not work, and the results will be poor because the total acquisition time will be prolonged too much. To avoid any artifacts or to reduce the risk for artifacts uh, for this step and shoot mode, uh, if there are changes uh, of the heartbeat during the image acquisition, um, uh, you can also use the so-called um, padding technique. So that means that uh, it's still a prospective approach, but during uh, mid-diastole, it's not a very short uh, image acquisition. We are opening up the, uh, the image window, so we get a little bit more information, not only from 70% of uh, the, uh, the heartbeat, but maybe from 50 to 80%, and you can, of course, open up this, uh, this image window as much as you want. Uh, and this will make you a little bit safer against pulsation artifacts. However, as bigger you make your image window or your time window for acquisition, as higher the radiation dose will be. So it's always a threshold between radiation exposure and risk for pulsation artifacts. What you have to keep in mind uh, when you're using a step-and-shoot protocol, a prospectively uh, triggered scan, is, uh, sorry, there are some technical issues here. Uh, what you have uh, to keep in mind when you're using a, a step and shoot protocol is uh, that uh, you just have information from the, um, from the diastole. And uh, just facing a technical problem, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, the images are not moving anymore.
I'm really sorry for this technical issue. I hope I can continue very quickly. There is it. Professor Lower, uh, if we if keep moving, I think uh, uh, Martin will address this. Uh. Okay. Yeah, because uh, should we? Nothing is working. <coughs> Nothing is working here. Don't have a live picture right now. Um, we can see you now on slide 47. But I don't have the live view. Whatever I'm doing, I don't have the live view. I have just the. I don't see the screen, which is not very comfortable. Uh, can you refresh it with F5, please? I already did and, and completely restarted everything, but... Um, yeah, I do it again. Thank you. Do you want to go to live view again, please? Please, yeah. I don't see anything. I don't see, well, no. now I have the live view, okay. But I don't see, um, um, I still don't see, I don't see a slide at the live view. My display at the at the back is just a white screen. I have the table above, but uh, I don't see my, my, my slides. I just see, uh, see the slides on the list uh, oh, above, but, but uh, at, live and, uh, at live view, I don't see a slide. So, uh, Christian, we can, we can see the slides. Uh, should we uh, do, um, keep moving? Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure audience can see because we can see the slides. But how should it talk? <laughs> right. Uh, do you want to log in again? Um, or something on. Uh, Christian, uh, people can see the screen if you have a PowerPoint open. Uh, then you can uh, keep talking and we will try to fix it during the time. If you, if you just say next slide, we can move the slides on your behalf if we all start from the same slide. That's really... I know it's a, a, a lot more difficult for you. That's really not not perfect, to be honest. <clears throat> Yes, of course. Let's do it like that. But that, that's really more than more than. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. Nothing else. Nothing else to do. So, am I alive again? Yeah, uh, we can uh, we can all hear you, and everyone can see the slides. If uh, you tell us, then Martin will keep moving the slides uh, as you say next slide, please. So hello to everybody. Uh, I'm really sorry for the technical issues here. Um, 
sometimes technique uh, technique at your home is not as good as technique at your scanner uh, is, but um, I think the most important thing is that, that we are good, do, uh, good things uh, for our patients. Well, um, again, uh, we stopped uh, to just talk about the, uh, the possibilities of, um, of uh, the so-called padding technique and the prospective uh, triggering technique. What you have to keep in mind is that when you're using a prospective triggering technique, um, you just have um, uh, diastolic information, so the systole is, uh, the systole is missing, and uh, um, if you would like to get some functional information, you should use another, uh, another technique and another option and another possibility. Um, when we go to the, to the next slide, um, just uh, to give you the summary about the uh, pros and cons of uh, prospective triggering, we have a pulsed exposition uh, and that's, therefore we have a low radiation dose. Uh, but uh, the disadvantages are we are just using a sequential acquisition, so we have a predefined acquisition window. The RR interval is only partially scanned, and uh, therefore the technique is vulnerable to, uh, to add effects. The, altern uh, the alternative, and we are moving to the next slide, uh, the alternative is uh, to use a retrospective uh, triggering uh, mode. Uh, this has been the, the first trigger mode that that has been applied. And uh, the principle of this retrospective gating is that we are acquiring spiral scans during the entire uh, cardiac cycle. So we are imaging the entire cardiac cycle and the entire volume, and the slices are reconstructed after scanning. Just to exemplify, I brought you an, uh, an, uh, a graph for that, just uh, demonstrating how, how it works in the clinical reality. So we have a continuous acquisition uh, of uh, continuous spiral acquisition, and we are defining our time point where, where we would like uh, to have our reconstruction uh, at the final end. And the really good uh, thing is, and the really advantage of uh, this technique is that uh, we can uh, define uh, this, uh, we can define different delay times afterwards. So that means we are ending up with a so-called uh, choice of best quality. We are able to produce our image data uh, for every single time point of the entire cardiac cycle. And this is uh, a, a big advantage uh, in, some, uh, in some questions because we really get the total overview about the, about the entire situation and we are become possible uh, to get even functional information. So we end up very different to the very different to the uh, uh, to the prospective triggering technique. We end up with uh, not only systolic, but even uh, with um, uh, diast not only with diastolic images, but even with uh, systolic images. However, we have to pay some price for that, and the price that we have to pay for that. Uh, is that we are explore, uh, using a continuous radiation, so that means that uh, our scanner uh, has, uh, this scan will uh, have a rather high radiation dose to the patient. And um, um, if uh, everything went fine and the, and the heartbeat of the patient was, uh, was normal, we will not use uh, too much out of, this, uh, this, uh, of the image data that we acquire. So we will just look for the diastolic images because they are the best, uh, having uh, uh, less, uh, less um, pulsation add effects. So that means that we will skip most of the information that we acquire. So it's not the best uh, economical use of the radiation dose that we uh, expose to the patient. However, the choice of best quality might be really uh, an, uh, an important add-on that we could get because uh, it gives you some functional information and if there is uh, some, uh, some problem or pulsation add effects, um, you are much safer against this because you are able to choose between the different, uh, the different phases and you can uh, select uh, the phase uh, providing uh, uh, the, least, uh, um, the least add effects. 
So that means that the different uh, options for uh, ECG synchronization, including the uh, uh, retrospective gating, the prospective triggering, uh, and, uh, and the retrospective gating without, uh, uh, with or without uh, dose modulation, uh, provides you with very different amounts of radiation dose. Um, uh, if you just uh, activate the, uh, the animation here, so retrospective gating without dose modulation means a radiation dose of 10 to 50 millisieverts, and a prospective triggering means a radiation dose down to uh, 1 to 3 millisieverts. What does it mean in reality? Well, it becomes a little bit more complex. As I already mentioned before, we have really an important influence uh, of the selected trigger technique on the radiation exposure. So it's not allowed to choose or to, to, to select uh, your um, trigger mode depending on your personal uh, preferences. You have to do it depending on the heart rate, the predest probability for coronary artery disease and the referring diagnosis. And uh, if you forward the animation, uh, it means in the clinical reality that the uh, cardiac CTA button uh, does not exist on your machine. So you have really to think about what to choose uh, for what kind of patient. We need really individual selection of the examination uh, protocol. Uh, this is really mandatory and required. Just as a summary and a very rough uh, uh, baseline or rough recommendation, um, the low heart rates below 65 uh, uh, um, uh, with a sinus rhythm and uh, the rule out of coronary artery disease for low risk patients uh, will be the best indication for using really the pure prospective triggered scan, the step and shoot, and this is combined uh, with uh, radiation exposure of one to two millisieverts. So that's really uh, the lowest radiation exposure that we, we could offer to the patient. If the heart rate is uh, intermediate, so it's between 65 and 75, uh, if you would like to get at least some wall motion analysis, and if the, uh, or if the indication is uh, an intermediate risk for a coronary artery disease, go for the sequence with padding. And uh, this will mean uh, two to five millisieverts to the patient. And the retrospective mode, which is uh, the most stable mode uh, according to pulsation artifacts, however, this should not be your standard mode because it's combined uh, with the highest radiation exposure. So it should be really restricted to high heart rates or uh, if really you would like to get some functional and valvular analysis, uh, and then, of course, you should go for the retrospective uh, trigger mode. Just again, we are talking about a big range of radiation dose uh, between 1 up to 8 to 10 millisieverts. So it's not a matter of your personal um, preferences. It's not a personal choice. It's really uh, the question of radiation dose. Uh, and you have to uh, select the trigger mode depending on the individual situation, depending on the heart rate, and depending on the, uh, on the, on the question that you would like to answer. If we move on, um, let's talk about the dose modulation. The principle of the dose modulation is uh, to take advantage out of the fact that usually we are uh, taking the images from a di diastole and that we don't need the images from systole. Of course, dose modulation uh, will just be applied for, for retrospective triggering or for the sequence with padding, not for the step and shoot. And the, the principle of the dose modulation is to uh, please uh, go forward in the animation is just to uh, to use the full amount of tube current for a diastole, but at systole to reduce the tube current down to 70%. And of course, uh, this will uh, heavily influence the total radiation exposure to the patient. And we will end up with images like those that we have a very good uh, um, 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 contrast to noise ratio at diastole. We have very noisy images at systole. So the systolic images are not enough for assessing the coronaries, but usually we are assessing the coronaries at diastole. But the quality is still uh, good enough for wall motion analysis when we are using this, uh, this dose modulation. And uh, this can reduce the total dose uh, um, of your scan by uh, up to 45%. So just by applying this dose modulation, we can reduce uh, even at the 64 slice scanners, the radiation dose uh, down to uh, below 10 millisieverts.
The next really important uh, way to reduce the radiation exposure to the patient was already addressed uh, uh, in the last webinar. It's uh, the, the adaption of the uh, acquisition technique and by using the low KV uh, technique. Well, we know that we are able to uh, reduce uh, the KV settings and to scan at low KVs, especially when we are talking about CT angiographies, because CT angiographies are high contrast examinations. And we know, if you go forward with the animation, we know that uh, the attenuation of iodine will become uh, higher when we are reducing the, um, the KV settings. So that means every molecule of the iodine gives more contrast. Uh, if it's allowed to say so, it will give more contrast when the KV settings are going down. And there is quite good evidence that we can apply this technique even uh, for cardiac CT. The first papers have been published on that even 10 years before. And nowadays it becomes even possible to scan uh, at 80 KV or even down uh, to 70 KV with very good uh, results, as you see just on this example. And of course, the radiation dose is going uh, dramatically uh, down. So just one, uh, one example, uh, how a protocol for, for um, an, an normal or, or female patient could look like. So 100 kV because the body mass index is 24 and the total dose length product for the entire examination was just 200 milligray per centimeters. So we are far below 5 millisieverts with that. And I will show you on the next slides just uh, the image quality. So fantastic diagnostic image quality here. Of course, this patient is suffering from coronary artery disease and nicely depicted here uh, on these scans and even this, um, this non-calcified stenosis uh, is nicely seen here uh, for this low KV scan. So it's a very efficient way to reduce the radiation dose without uh, losing any diagnostic image quality. And finally, of course, you can also reduce your MIS settings and compensate uh, the missing information or the missing uh, contrast by using an iterative reconstruction to reduce uh, the uh, background noise. And there is even quite good evidence, of course, uh, that you can use this technique for cardiac imaging as well. So if you go to the literature nowadays, you will find really a lot of papers uh, uh, making clear that the iterative image reconstruction is a very useful tool even for cardiac uh, CT imaging. To sum up uh, this uh, part of reducing the radiation dose, which is definitely the uh, most important part of my presentation today, the way of ECG synchronization has relevant influence on the total radiation dose. The personalized definition of the scan protocol according to the heart rate and the clinical situation is required. And scanning at low uh, KV is really, really highly efficient and a very good way to really reduce um, the radiation exposure to the patient. And again, we have different modes nowadays. There is no single uh, a protocol for cardiac CT anymore. We have to individually uh, uh, choose because the range is between 1 to 10 millisieverts. And it seems that uh, in the very close future, scanning below 1 millisievert will become routinely possible. And just finally, an overview about this really exciting technical improvement in a very short period of time. Uh, the uh, spatial resolution went down uh, to far below uh, 0 0.5. The scan time went down far below, below one uh, second. And the radiation dose went down uh, far below one millisievert. And that's really a story of success, providing very new and very exciting uh, clinical possibilities here. And uh, when we are talking about reducing the KV settings, it's another very, very helpful tool, as we have learned uh, last, uh, last uh, time before summer, that um, uh, it also helps you to reduce the contrast dose to the patients. Uh, we have learned that the attenuation, again, of iodine becomes higher as lower the KV settings are. There are a really direct relationship a mathematical relationship, how much attenuation every, every uh, milligram of iodine will give you. So that means if you're scanning at low KV, you could either use the same amount of iodine to get even higher uh, intravascular attenuation, or you can use the advantage of this higher attenuation of iodine to reduce the amount of iodine given to the patient. 
And there is not only the safety issue that it's recommended to reduce the amount of, um, of iodine given to the patient to reduce the risk for, cardio, uh, for, for contrast-induced nephropathy. There is also uh, an, a practical and diagnostic issue on that. So less is definitely more. Uh, when you're using low KV protocols, you can even reduce the iodine dose. Um, since this becomes higher, as lower the KV settings are, and less iodine concentration is needed while scanning at low KV settings uh, for clinical purposes. And I will show you why this is important in the clinical routine just in the next couple of slices. Because we, the, the, the question for cardiac CT is not only to provide a luminography, to provide something very similar to coronary angel, we can do even more because we can provide uh, information about the situation at uh, the uh, vessel wall, and this is practically important. And uh, if the uh, intravascular uh, contrast is too bright, uh, then uh, this could interfere with the assessment of uh, changes in the vessel wall. And the changes in the vessel wall are really, really important to be demonstrated, and this is really an advantage compared to invasive coronary angel. So we are able uh, we are able uh, to assess uh, the plaques and to differentiate different plaque components, and that's really clinically important. And therefore, we should reduce uh, the intravascular contrast not to interfere with the assessment here. Why it's important to assess the plaque components? Because it has been shown that we are able, to, uh, by a cardiac CT, to identify plaque components uh, describing a really risk, uh, risk for rupture. So we can be able to differentiate um, a dangerous uh, plaque and to differentiate from a stable plaque. It's a very small paper, but very interesting paper from Boston, and they really found a good correlation between the presence or absence of an acute coronary syndrome and the so-called positive remodeling, spotty calcifications, and the low density of the plaque. And uh, I will just show you one example of such a really dangerous plaque, nicely imaged at, uh, with coronary CT. So it's not a high-grade stenosis, but you see it's a huge plaque with huge positive remodeling, so a lot of extra uh, luminal uh, plank, plaque component with a very low central density. So that's really um, a plaque with really high risk, uh, with really high risk for rupture. And it's really important. Uh, it's really important to uh, demonstrate uh, such um, uh, such a plaque. <clears throat> uh, and to describe these plaque components, and the only way to go for that is, uh, and the only way uh, to go for that is uh, uh, not to have a too intense intravascular uh, contrast. So we have, as soon as we are reducing the KV, we have to reduce the iodine flux and the total iodine load to the patient. And of course, uh, this is increasing uh, the safety uh, to the patient because um, uh, because uh, the risk for contrast-induced nephropathy uh, will be reduced. And that's a, uh, a rather new paper here, uh, surprisingly uh, published uh, under the uh, subspeciality of press, but it's dedicated to coronary plaques, so maybe this was wrong at European uh, radiology. But uh, uh, what you can nicely see here and, and what this paper really nicely showed uh, was the fact uh, that um, with uh, appropriate image technique, we are really are able to detect the lipid core of plaques and to demonstrate uh, the issues uh, that we have to know for plaque at uh, risk uh, for rupture. So let me uh, summarize up uh, this part of my presentation. Lower KV protocols allow for lowering the total iodine load the reduced iodine flux as compared to high concentration protocols facilitates the assessment of vessel wall and plaque components. And uh, I think that uh, 320 concentration at a flow rate of 4 to 5 ml per second is definitely the new standard. And this will allow you to, to nicely assess even changes at the uh, vessel wall, including the coronary plaque assessment.
Finally, uh, some uh, practical tips how to reduce uh, problems or artifacts at uh, CT and geography of the coronary arteries. And of course, there might be problems. There might be problems due to the motion of the patient, problems due to respiratory motion, and the most important ones, uh, artifacts due to uh, the cardiac motion or uh, pulsation. As already mentioned before, that the artifacts due to a patient's motion can be avoided due to very rapid acquisition. And of course, if you really explain to the patient that it's very, very important that uh, the patient is not moving during the scan, uh, usually uh, patient motion is not an issue. Uh, respiratory motion uh, might be an issue, especially in patients with uh, shortness of breath and uh, if they're really scared about the scan. But usually, if you're using fast scanning and if you really explain to the patient uh, what you expect to do and, and what you expect from the patient, breathing artifacts should not be a problem. However, the clinical most relevant problems are still the problems to the cardiac motion for different reasons. First of all, not all the patients have a perfect heart rate when they come to the scan. And uh, second, uh, in some patients, there is a change of the heart rate during the administration and during the acquisition, and this can be a, a significant problem as well. We know since uh, early beginnings and early times of cardiac CT that there is a direct relationship between the heart rate and the image quality. And this has remained more or less unchanged, even uh, with very modern scanners. Of course, they are less sensitive, but still uh, the motion artifacts due to cardiac motion remains still the most critical factor uh, for the quality. So I proposed you and I promised to give you some practical tips how to avoid or how, how you can deal uh, with this issue. Uh, and I will give you some tips what you can do before the scan, what you can do during the scan, and what you can do after the scan. And the, the uh, third part will be the shortest one because there is not too much to do after the scan. So you really have to think about it uh, before uh, you start what to do. What you can do before is uh, heart rate control, patient instruction and training. Uh, what you can do during is ECG synchronization, acquisition parameters changes. And again, afterwards, not too much uh, can be done. Well, the best way to deal with motion artifacts, of course, is to avoid them. And uh, so you have to be aware and you have to think about it before. And uh, this might help you the most to avoid the artifacts. So if a patient comes in with um, a high heart rate, what to do? Of course, you can vote for another test. You can say, well, cardiac CT is, is not, not the, uh, the best test for you. Uh, please forward the, uh, uh, the animation. So you can say stop, get out of here. Of course, you can send the patient back to wherever the patient comes. But the problem is, of course, if you do that uh, uh, quite often, this could be seen as a dead end and no one uh, maybe will send you a patient back again. What you can do and definitely what you have to do is to try your best to reduce the heart rate. How you can do that? You can do that by giving better blockers to the patients. There's quite good evidence that you can do that, and this is helpful. This is a very good paper as published in the American Journal of Cardiology, evaluating that uh, um, many patients are in need for better blockers, uh, and the problem is that in many cases, the beta blockade is not sufficient because they don't receive enough beta blockers or even no beta blockers. But even if they receive sufficient beta blockade, about uh, a quarter uh, did not reach the optimal heart rate. So that means in a clinical reality that uh, even by extensive use of beta blockers, there might be patients or situations in whom or in which the heart rate can't be lowered. It might be in children, in heart transplant recipients, but even in emergencies, maybe it's not helpful if you're playing around with beta blockers uh, in, uh, in uh, emergency situation, and even in, in patients suffering from atrial fibrillation, it will not be possible uh, uh, to, to block them just by giving beta blockers. And of course, there are patients with contraindications against beta blockers, uh, or patients uh, uh, which uh, do not reach the target heart rate uh, even after getting better block it, uh, better blockers. What you can do in such a case, of course, again, you can uh, consider another test. Uh, you can adapt your um, examination parameters. And this is that uh, what I would like to show you, what you can do and how to 
you can optimize your uh, examination uh, parameters in patients with high heart rates where you just have to take uh, the scan uh, regardless of the fact that uh, the patient did not reach the target heart rate. As mentioned, one way to go is the selection of the appropriate uh, ECG synchronization mode. Again, be careful on that. It not only means reduction of, uh, of artifacts, but it also means maybe uh, a really increase of the radiation dose. So you have to be careful. You have to be very, um, you have to really think about, and you should not just go for retrospective uh, uh, triggering in all the patients just to, uh, to use the choice of best quality and just to make your life easier. You can also uh, scan without having uh, severe problems patients with high heart rates and not using the retrospective triggering and giving the most uh, radiation dose to the patient. What way to go, and definitely this is uh, what we are doing in, in such a situation, is to use the padding technique and to slightly enlarge the imaging window. Of course, I told you before, as larger the image window, as higher the heart rate. But if you, uh, if you open up the image window just for 40 to 80 percent, you still have uh, only 40 percent of the entire uh, cardiac cycle um, uh, exposed to radiation dose. So you will still end up with a much lower radiation dose as compared to the retrospective gating. So this is what we are doing. Maybe this is not enough. Maybe you have to do even more. Uh, but uh, really an, an, an advantage of using this technique is that uh, you can still or again choose from different faces and uh, uh, it provides you uh, some kind of possibility of a limited choice of best quality. Of course, uh, you can talk about uh, retrospective gating at very low dose. This has very recently been published. Uh, however, I'm personally still not a friend of this, but this has been published this year, that you can go for 70 kV retrospective ECG gating and you might end up uh, very stable uh, against uh, pulsation artifacts, but a really, uh, at the price of a really low uh, radiation dose. If you agree with me and you will, you will not go for the retrospective ECG gating, you can use your sequence with an enlarged uh, uh, image window, and you can change the direction of the dose modulation. Uh, the di direction of the dose modulation. What does it mean? Sounds a little bit uh, strange. Well, I demonstrated to you before the, the basic principle of dose modulation, and usually in normal heart rates, you are using the full amount of, uh, of tube current for diastole, and you are reducing it at systole. Um, but uh, if the heart rate goes up, we know that the systolic images become more important. So what we can do is just to change the direction of this dose modulation. This is the normal view for dose modulation in low heart rates. And in high heart rates, we can do it in a totally, uh, in, a, in a completely different way. So we are just changing and we are reducing the radiation exposure not at systole, but at diastole. So we have the blurry images from diastole and we have the sharp images from systole. Since we know that at higher heart rates, the coronaries are better seen at systole, at, at, uh, systole, uh, at systole than at diastole, sorry. So just two practical examples. So we have a patient with a rather low heart rate of 65. So we went for the sequence and we used the typical and normal way of dose modulation. So you have these blurry images from systole with uh, uh, iterative reconstruction and you have the nice image quality at uh, diastole, very sharp images and very good contrast to noise ratio. Another example, uh, higher heart rate, heart rate above 80. So we uh, decided to change the direction of the dose modulation. So we have the full dose at the systole with really nice images without any pulsation side effects, and we have the blurry images at diastole since we know that um, the coronaries can nicely be seen uh, at high heart rates at systole. What else uh, can we do? Of course, we can think about using a really, really very fast acquisition, a high pitch acquisition, but this is not helpful uh, in my experience. And even if you look at the literature about the publication uh, using a high pitch scan, they just uh, included the perfect patients with heart rates uh, below 60 beats per minute. 
So the flash scan is fantastic because it's quick, but it's dangerous. And um, uh, artifacts, especially at high heart rates, are really common. I would not recommend it. However, there are indications that this uh, really quick acquisition might be helpful, uh, which is in, uh, in children. Uh, children usually, especially the very small children, usually they have a really high heart rate, up to 140, as this newborn with uh, less than 3 kilogram, um, a patient, uh, a child with uh, pulmonary atresia. And we decided to scan this patient without uh, ECG triggering, just uh, by using this, uh, this very quick acquisition, this high pitch scan. And as you can see here, really nice uh, image quality, really nice results. And uh, the price for, is, for that was really, really low. The total dose length product for the anti-examination, including monitoring and topogram, was just four milligray per centimeters. So really, really, really low dose by using this flash scan. The acquisition was less than one second, so even without anesthesia and with just three ml of contrast. Finally, what has been published as one possible solution for uh, imaging at high heart rates is systolic, images, uh, systolic imaging. So uh, taking advantage of what I have said before, when the heart rate is high, systolic images uh, become more important. And they, are, they have been published a prospectively triggered scan, um, a step and shoot scan in high heart rates, uh, but uh, this, uh, the shoot not at diastole, but at systole. But for me, it's still a little bit too critical, and uh, maybe uh, radiation uh, pulsation artifacts might be uh, too, uh, too common here, or uh, for me, it's too risky. As mentioned, not uh, too many things can be done after the scan, so not too much. Of course, if you have more than one phase, if you don't have just the step and shoot, but uh, at least padding. Take advantage of this choice of best quality. Really use everything that the scanner is providing to you and never rely on the best systolic or the best diastolic phases. They are not always the best. So we don't have many possibilities afterwards. We need appropriate planning uh, beforehand. We should uh, give better blockers uh, to the patients uh, we have to inject the right contrast agent and we have to select the appropriate scan mode uh, of the patients. And of course, uh, we should rethink the dose modulation. Uh, scanning quick, of course, is helpful. Uh, it's not solving all the problems, but definitely it's helpful and uh, you should uh, think about this uh, beforehand. That's really important to plan everything before because afterwards we are not able um, uh, to do uh, that many things. Let me uh, summarize up everything. The heart rate is still a crucial factor for image quality at coronary CTA. The target heart rate can or should be reached by pharmacological intervention, or at least you should try your best to reach it. And lowering the heart rate will improve the image quality and will reduce the radiation dose. There are patients or conditions where the lowering the heart rate cannot be achieved. In such a situation, the systolic dose modulation in combination with sequence and padding is highly recommended, and you should really go for a multiphasic analysis of all available data to improve the quality uh, of your examination. And by using uh, the latest ultrafast sc uh, generation scanners and by following uh, the recommendations mentioned above, uh, and high diagnostic image uh, accuracy can be reached even in patients with high heart rates, and a high diagnostic accuracy can be reached even in patients with atrial fibrillation. So this is end of chapter two about less is more, and I really uh, hope I could show you, despite uh, the technical issues uh, that we faced here, that less radiation dose in CT angiography is possible. Uh, by uh, personalized selection of ECG synchronization uh, as a key factor for radiation dose reduction, and scanning at lower KV is highly efficient in radiation and contrast dose reduction. Less contrast dose in CT angiography, scanning at lower KV allows for redu uh, uh, reduced total dose of iodine, and reduced iodine concentration allows for efficient vessel wall analysis. And less problems in artifacted CT angiography of the heart 
uh, heart rate reduction by beta blockers allows for artifact and radiation dose reduction and using of the appropriate contrast agent and concentration allows for the reduction of artifacts and discomfort to the patient. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here with me and uh, apologize again for the technical issues that we faced here. So I hope it was of interest uh, for you to listen to the less is more chapter and I would be more than happy to welcome you very soon to the third chapter, what becomes possible going into clinical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Laura. It was an excellent presentation despite all the technical difficulties we had. Thank you very much for going through the whole subject, and I also sincerely apologize to the audience uh, for uh, the technical glitch we had. But uh, I'm sure the message has gone through very well, and uh, we have been having questions. Uh, so, Professor Laura, the first question is very straightforward. Is 16-slice CT scan capable of acquiring a good CCTA? It's a very good question. Of uh, of course, it's politically difficult to answer. Uh, when the 16 size scanners came up, of course, a lot of publications have been done um, advocating that we can reach at least 120% sensitivity and 150% specificity. And then the next generation of scanners came up, and of course, the they, they publication told us that they are even better as the already perfect uh, 16 size scanners. Well, I have a lot of a uh, lot of patients coming on a frequent basis, like the heart transplant recipients. Uh, so, where I can really directly compare 16 to 64, and now to the, the third generation scanners. Looking back, uh, it's it seems critical nowadays uh, to do a CT angiography at 16 slice. I would say uh, uh, it's really start to become uh, clinically appropriate at 64 slices. If you have really so perfect uh, perfect. Pardon me? Yeah. yeah. I was saying your recommendation is for a 64 slide, uh, and that yes. is and above. that yeah. you have. Yeah, good. Thank yeah. you. And, uh, next question, I'm, I'm sure you have already addressed in this slide, but just to highlight again, the, what is the highest heart rate uh, we can get a high-quality image during an cardiac angio? I mean, where you will be comfortable. I know you, yeah. you've been... 65, 75, and above. But uh, yes. just to bring the point back, there is there is definitely no clear no clear cutoff. It it really um, uh, it mainly depends on on two key key factors. First of all, is what is the equipment that you're using? What sorry, what is the scanner that you're using? So as as better the scanner, as higher the the acceptable heart rate. And the second one, and this is really the the most important issue, is the second one is uh, the the uh, how stable is your rhythm. So if you have a very, very stable uh, heart rate, so I have the experience in heart transplant recipients, they have all a really high heart rate, but that's really stable, like a pacemaker rhythm, then you can uh -huh. achieve fantastic results even at a heart rate of 90 to 95. If okay. it's a high heart rate in combination with some kind of arrhythmia, then it's, uh, it's really dangerous, and then I would uh, move the cut off further down. But there is no, no number that I, I could provide you. Yeah. It really so, depends uh, on the machine. I, I think your message is very clear. It's not only the heart rate, but also the rhythm, which is all important. So they have to consider both for uh, considering when they will get a good quality image. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the next question is about breathing techniques. Uh, what is your experience with breathing techniques to lower the heart rate during a scan? Uh, so... Do you choose any breathing yeah, I really like to the Yeah, I really like to, to, to use, well, uh, what we are still doing, uh, of course we can discuss on that, but, but we are still starting with a calcium scoring scan when, when we have a rule out scan, so we are doing that still. Of course we can discuss if it's mandatory or not. But I really like this uh, this uh, uh, this calcium scoring because it's a good test, and then we are really observing what happened with the heart rate uh, during the breath hold. Because many patients, uh, in many patients, the heart rate is really going down uh, during the uh -huh. breath hold. So uh, some patients re uh, are reaching the the heart rate, the target heart rate, without beta blockers just by by this breath hold. So to train to explain and to, to, to watch what happened with the heart rate uh, depending on the, on, on the breathing is highly recommended and make, make help to, to, uh, to save your life or to make your life easier. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really recommended to, to train with the patients, yeah. 
So, so breathing technique it does help, and it's good to teach yep. your patient how to do breath hold and observe during that time so that you know what will be the effect on the patient heart rate. So thank you. Very clear answer. Uh, next is very uh, direct question. I think you have addressed in detail, but quickly if you can touch on what is padding technology? Uh, I, I think they're asking about the padding. Padding, uh, yeah. yeah. The, padding is a prospective, the padding is a prospectively triggered scan. So it's prospectively triggered. So we are defining the, uh, the delay from the R wave to start of the scan. However, it's not a pure step and shoot. So it's not just at one time point of the hour interval. So we are, we are opening up the, the trigger window. And that means uh -huh. we are getting more information uh, from, the, from the cardiac cycle. And we can define this image window. Of course, you uh -huh. can use a padding from 0 to 100. And it's some kind of a retrospective scan, but it's still prospectively triggered. And it's always a threshold between opening up this window. That means you are uh -huh. stable against uh, artifacts but you're increasing the radiation dose uh, when you yeah. open up. So, but uh, for me, it's my most favorite. So we are doing about 80 to 85% of all my patients uh, are scanned by a, by a padding technique. Uh -huh, we are just uh -huh. adapting the image window depending on the heart rate. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Oh, I think it's very simply you have explained that we expand the exposure window on both sides where we want to actually scan so that we don't miss that part. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Next question is about the effect of a vasodilator. I think enginine is a nitrate. I don't know what, because it's the commercial name. How do you overcome the effect of enginine which causes vasodilatation in a normal coronary but would not affect the tight stenotic segment? How would you calculate the percentage of stenosis in these patients? In patients so with vasodilator uh, to calculation of percentage yeah. of stenosis. Yeah. Well, there, there is still ongoing discussion in the literature if, uh, if we should really give the, the vasodilator in all, in, in all the examinations. Uh, we are not doing that. However, in the, at the coronary angel, they are giving the, the vasodilator, so they are always uh, measuring the, uh, the uh, stenosis severity in patients after giving uh, vasodilators. Um, what I really uh, realized is that not all the patients uh, really appreciate if you give the vasodilator, they, they become headache. And, uh, of course, sometimes the, the heart rate is going up. So okay, we, are, yeah. we are inducing an, an, an yeah. not wanted, yeah, an adverse reaction. In, uh, we don't want to uh, increase the heart rate. So that's why we are not giving uh, the vasodilator as a routine. Okay, so it's not your routine practice. So thank you very much for that. Nope. Now, next question from, is from a pediatric radiologist. I think they have 128 slides CT. What do you consider any top limit heart rate to perform a prospective or retrospective coronary CT? Uh, and they have a, a CT scan of 128 slides. The question is, is really, uh, in a pediatric population, is really what is the question that you would like to answer? So if it's just uh, the, the anatomy and not the coronary anatomy, so if the, the cardiac anatomy, so you would like to see the great vessels and uh, you would get an overview about the collaterals uh, in case of pulmonary atresia or something like that, it's maybe better to, to totally skip the, the idea of triggering and do just the fastest scan as, as you can do because the acquisition times and the temporal resolution might be really, really quick enough to provide a pulsation-free uh, view uh, on the picture. If you are talking about, um, about if you really would like to uh, investigate the coronary arteries, then it becomes critical because the very small children that came in with a heart rate about 140 to 150, and it's not possible to block them by better blockers down to 70. Uh -huh. However, I would still not not mention here and a clear cut of number. So I don't uh -huh. want to give you numbers. It really depends on on your system and your experience, and on the on the on the. Um, on the heart rhythm, how stable the, the rhythm is, and the, the questions that you would like to answer. So, so uh, no numbers we discussed, <laughs> yeah. in, in the previous uh, discussion, it's not only the rhythm, but it's also the, uh, it's not only the rate, but also the <laughs> rhythm. And in pediatrics, it's very exactly. pertinent to exactly know what question we have to answer. Is it the coronaries or other anatomy we are looking at? So, totally I think right. we have a series of pediatric questions.
can you repeat the issues we found in flash scan in pediatrics? Any artifacts? Flash scanning in pediatrics? Yeah. Any artifacts Sorry, you can comment on? Well, uh, it, it's pretty much the same. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. It's pretty much the same answer uh, as before. Um, when you would like to to see the coronary arteries, I would even in the pediatric population maybe not go for a, for a flash scan, uh, but would go for a, for a sequence with padding. Uh, if it's about uh, anatomy, then a flash scan is is a fantastic tool because acquisition time is less than one second. You don't need anesthesia, uh, and and the radiation dose is really 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 low, far 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 below 0 0.1 millisieverts. So it's uh -huh. definitely not an issue of radiation dose anymore. But it's, again, it depends on, on the question that you would like to answer. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, we have, again, another pediatric question. The image quality yep. of uh, pediatric CTA, any advice, any good advice, how to improve? I think you've just answered that, uh, but any additional point you want to highlight? Yes, definitely. Um, 70 kV. Uh, if your scanner is able to, to produce 70 kV images, go for 70 kV um, in a pediatric population. Uh, second, don't trust the, the protocols that the scanner initially provides you. So you have to, to do it manually. You have to reduce the reference MIS um, because usually the, the, there is a trend of the scanner manufacturers to have rather higher dose protocols for a clear explanation. Mm -hmm. Higher dose means brighter images, and of course, uh, the people selling machines would like to end up with uh, bright and nice images. But uh, mm -hmm. especially in the pediatric population, we have to manually adapt to that. And uh, yeah, if you have it, uh, the, 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 the flash scan is, is really a um, uh, very, good, very good tool. We are doing a lot of pediatric scans now, and our dose length product for the entire examination is, uh, as a standard, uh, five uh, milligrams per centimeters, including the topogram, including the monitoring and the, and, and the monitoring trigger, which is almost nothing. That's really amazing. And so uh, just as an advertisement, uh -huh. sorry, just one advertisement. Uh, for the third webinar, uh, at least one third will be focused on pediatric cardiac CT. So just <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. It's important to convey the message. And um, yeah, so the key message here is use low 70 kV and flash if you have it, right? Yes. For pediatric population. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes. Next question is about contrast uh, um, media, and they want to know the flow rate if we are using iodine uh, 300, 320, or 350 milligram concentration. Um, well, it's everything just the uh, just the question. Uh, it's uh, it's always just the question of the uh, total amount of iodine. So um, I just proposed uh, very roughly, but uh, this will be uh, more practically addressed in the in the last webinar as well. So really providing you different uh, examples. Depending on the on the KV settings, you have to use your standard protocol, and then you have to adapt it depending on the iodine concentration of your contrast agent. So if I, I, I introduced uh, for 320 to go for a flow rate uh, of 4 to 5 ml, depending on the KV settings, if you have a, a 350 or 370 or 400 concentration, you have just to reduce uh, the flow rate, uh, so the, the iodine amount per, per time uh, to end up with a similar approach. So it's a very, very easy calculation that you have to do. So it's more about the flux, I mean, how... how what rate and how much iodine how much yeah. exactly how I much mean, iodine per second that's that's the yeah, key okay. factor yeah. yeah yeah thank you and now um, the next question is about uh, your preference for timing bolus technique or fluoro triggering uh, technique for optimizing contrast yep. timing for coronary cta well um we are standardized and even for children we are using the bolus triggering um, and uh, yeah, we are triggering in the in the ascending aorta, and uh, we have a uh, couple of seconds delay time after uh, uh, reaching the, the threshold, and then we are starting. We are never using a best guess technique, 
uh, we always use this bolus triggering technique. Okay, thank you. So your recommendation is for bolus technique, uh, trigger technique. Thank you. Uh, next question is about uh, the reconstruction of images. When we use very low KV of AT, uh, considering there will be more noise, how would you reconstruct uh, um, iterative reconstruction for these images? Is there a way to reduce the noise? Well, usually the, the the reduction of the KV is not not producing so much noise. It's the combination of low KV and and reduced MIS settings. Then this is producing a little bit more noise. And uh, the iterative uh, the use of iterative reconstruction is the way to to reduce the noise. Yeah, but so and uh, we are talking. But didn't uh, give the question right. They, I think they don't have the iterative uh, reconstruction. So if they don't have it, what we can do? If you don't have, uh, well, uh, what is all, always helpful is, um, and that's a, that's a matter of your workflow to to reconstruct uh, reconstruct out from the source data a so-called secondary raw data set. So very very thin slices, very thin collimation. And this uh, uh, secondary raw data set should be used for you 3D reconstruction. But, uh, but on top, uh, for, for really reading the images, uh, you, can, you can reconstruct thicker slices to reduce the noise. A very simple approach. So reconstruct uh, images with a collimation of one, uh, one millimeter um, and a 50% overlap, or even go for 1.2 or so. This will reduce uh, the um, will reduce the, the the noise, but will mm -hmm. still uh, remain a diagnostic image quality for you, and you will remain able to assess uh, uh, plaques and, 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 and lesions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so basically, have more secondary raw data, and you'll be able to process a good image. Exactly. Next question is, please share your insight regarding the effect of full dose of contrast media, I mean bolus of ml per second, to the heart rate of the patient. So do you adjust according to the heart rate of the patient? The bolus? No. 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 Thanks. No. Very but uh, <laughs> what we observed is... What we observed is that uh, the, the heart rate reaction to, to different contrast agents could be different. So uh, it depends on the contrast that you're giving. Uh, if the heart rate is increasing tremendously during, uh, during scanning or, or not so much. But we are not adapting uh, our injection to the, to, the, uh, to the heart rate. Of course, uh, if you would do it really, really very academic, you could do an adaption to to the cardiac output, then you have to go for for a test bolus administration, and then you have to do some fancy calculations. From my experience, it's a little bit an overkill. You don't need it. Uh, you can you will end up with fantastic results just by bolus triggering, and I think it's still even one one goal to keep things as simple as even possible. Cardiac CT has become a little bit more complex because we have these different uh, acquisition modes now, so we have to think about it. I think the contrast administration protocol should be kept as simple and as safe as even possible, and it's very, very stable uh, to define your, your fixed protocols depending on the body mass index and the KV settings, as I introduced uh, in my first webinar, and, and to work with them. They are, they are safe, so not too much risk for contrast-induced nephropathy, and they are very simple uh, uh, to be applied. Even if your, your stuff is maybe new or not so experienced, uh, you can provide them with a very good uh, guideline uh, to end up with very safe uh, and stable results. Good. Thank you. Uh, I think a related question, but uh, it is uh, about a patient who has a very high BMI, how much KV can be reduced in case of a high BMI patient for scanning with different concentrations of iodine? Yeah, if the if the patient is highly obese, I would not reduce the KV. I would go okay. for 120 KV. Okay. So that's very clear, again, because we don't want to compromise the image, and if patient has more than... 120 kg, then we go with, oh, sorry, if it's a high BMI, then we go with 120 kV. Exactly. 
Yeah, a slightly different topic. Speaking of calcium scoring, do you have exact cutoff value for calcium scoring and when do you proceed with CTA? No, we don't have uh, the dedicated uh, uh, cutoff values, uh, but uh, there are few patients where we decided not to continue with the CTA, but it's um, a combination of the total amount and the distribution. So you might find in diabetic patients really high uh, total amount or in, in, in patients with uh, a chronic nephropathy and really high total amount of uh, calcium, but more diffuse, uh, including the entire coronary arteries. And usually, then you are able to to really nicely assess uh, the the lumen behind the plaques. If you have really a severe coronary artery disease, then you might have a, a huge deposition of calcifications at the more proximal parts, mm-hmm. and then there is the risk that exactly those areas cannot be assessed by CT, and then you really have to to think about uh, stopping. Because uh-huh. that's even the wrong the, the wrong indication for a cardiac CT. It's still mostly the low to intermediate predisprobability. probability, and mm-hmm. a patient with really calcium above 2,000 is not a low risk patient anymore. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they 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 should, uh, the one probably go for angio and what we need to tackle them yep. with that. Yeah, thank you. Now this next question is about uh, uh, dual energy scans and. Here, what is the maximum heart rate for coronary angio? Do you adjust or consider for for dual dual energy uh, scanners? We are not not using dual energy technique for the heart. <coughs> we are using the the the, the second uh, the second uh, uh, source to increase the temporal resolution, but we are not using as a uh, as a dual dual energy principle. Um, this is not a clinical uh, routine yet for cardiac CT. There are some papers uh, playing around with iodine, getting iodine maps even from the myocardium to, to get some perfusion information. But uh, honestly speaking, I don't have an experience on that. So we are right. just using the, the, the second source for speeding up. Yeah, uh, but our last question is again on dual energy, but uh, if you can maybe just touch on it again. Uh, we can, uh, they say uh, sometimes on coronary CT dual energy scan, we cannot remove or suppress the calcium. Can you give us some idea how we can prevent it? They're talking in relation to iodine. Um, uh, and there's an abbreviation, I don't uh, really understand, HAAP to iodine. <clears throat> it's about uh, I think it's about the differentiation between between uh, calcification and iodine by by using the dual energy technique. Ah, okay. So uh, I don't have any. Uh, if, right. if, if I got it right, I don't have any experience on that. I have experience on the peripheral vessels, and it's not not working out perfectly for the peripheral vessels because usually uh, too much information is cut away if you if you're doing that. So the automatic hmm. reconstruction is not. So I'm a little bit uh, doubtful if it could work mm-hmm. but uh, for the coronaries, but I don't have uh, personal experience on that, to be honest. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lohr, I would really like to thank you. Uh, I think we have to end by 9.30, uh, and we have had good question and an excellent presentation. I would also like to once again apologize for the technical glitch we had, uh, but I would also like to remind all the audience to please complete a survey they'll get by an email and also they can revisit the presentation online it will be available Uh, so do visit and uh, keep learning and hopefully we'll uh, talk to you soon thank you very much and have a good day